the Medical Missionary Manual, Section 1, Origin, Purpose, and Future. Chapter 1, Why the Medical Missionary and Health Message was Given to the Remnant Church. What makes it so important to the lives and work of a people keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus and to a world on the brink of destruction? 1. Here is the work that lies before us. Go to all the world with the message. We are now living in the closing scenes of this world's history. Let men tremble with the sense of the responsibility of knowing the truth. The ends of the world are come. Proper consideration of these things will lead all to make an entire consecration of all that they have and are to their God. The weighty obligation of warning a world of its coming doom is upon us. From every direction, far and near, calls are coming to us for help. Evangelism, page 16. We should now feel the responsibility of laboring with intense earnestness to impart to others the truths that God has given for this time. We cannot be too much in earnest. Now is the time for the last warning to be given. There is a special power in the presentation of the truth at the present time. But how long will it continue? Only a little while. If there was ever a crisis, it is now. All are now deciding their eternal destiny. Men need to be aroused to realize the solemnity of the time, the nearness of the day when human probation shall be ended. Evangelism, pages 16 and 17. If diligent effort had been given to the work of making known the truth for this time in the cities that are unwarned, they would now not be as impenitent as they are. From the light that has been given me, I know that we might have had today thousands more rejoicing in the truth if the work had been carried forward as the situation demands in many aggressive lines. Evangelism, page 21. We have no time to lose. The end is near. The passage from place to place to spread the truth will soon be hedged with dangers on the right hand and on the left. Everything will be placed to obstruct the way of the Lord's messengers so that they will not be able to do that which is possible for them to do now. We must look our work fairly in the face and advance as fast as possible in aggressive warfare. Evangelism Pages 30 to 31. Now is the time for the last warning to be given. There is a special power in the presentation of the truth at the present time. But how long will it continue? Only a little while. If there was ever a crisis, it is now. All are now deciding their eternal destiny. Men need to be aroused to realize the solemnity of the time, the nearness of the day, when human probation shall be ended. Decided efforts should be made to bring the message for this time prominently before the people. The third angel is to go forth with great power. Let none ignore this work or treat it as of little importance. Testimonies for the Church Volume 6, page 16. 2. Here is a basic underlying problem. How to reach people and win their confidence. To reach the people wherever they are and whatever their position or condition, and to help them in every way possible, this is true ministry. Ministry of Healing, page 156. Everywhere there are hearts crying out for something which they have not. They long for a power that will give them mastery over sin, 
a power that will deliver them from the bondage of evil, a power that will give health and life and peace. Ministry of Healing, page 143. God's plan is first to reach the heart. Ministry of Healing, page 157. Your success will not depend so much upon your knowledge and accomplishments as upon your ability to find your way to the heart. Evangelism, page 437. 3. This basic problem has been solved. Christ solved it. By methods peculiarly his own, he helped all who were in sorrow and affliction. Ministry of Healing, page 23. Never was there such an evangelist as Christ. He was the majesty of heaven, but he humbled himself to take our nature that he might meet men where they were. He went from city to city, from town to town, preaching the gospel and healing the sick. Ministry of Healing, page 22. 4. How did Christ solve it? By meeting their needs. Our Lord Jesus Christ came to this world as the unwearied servant of man's necessity. He took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses, that he might minister to every need of humanity. The burden of disease and wretchedness and sin he came to remove. It was his mission to bring to men complete restoration. He came to give them health and peace and perfection of character. Varied were the circumstances and needs of those who besought his aid, and none who came to him went away unhelped. From him flowed a stream of healing power, and in body and mind and soul men were made whole. Ministry of Healing Page 17. During his ministry, Jesus devoted more time to healing the sick than to preaching. He was like a vital current diffusing life and joy. Ministry of Healing, pages 19 to 20. What a busy life he led. Wherever he went, he carried blessing. Ministry of Healing, Page 24 The Savior made each work of healing an occasion for implanting divine principles in the mind and soul. This was the purpose of his work. He imparted earthly blessings that he might incline the hearts of men to receive the gospel of his grace. Ministry of Healing, Page 20 just as we trace the pathway of a stream of water by the line of living green it produces, so Christ could be seen in the deeds of mercy that marked his pathway at every step. Wherever he went, health sprang up, and happiness followed wherever he passed. Welfare Ministry, page 57. 5. Should we employ his method? It is the only method that works. If ever it has been essential that we understand and follow right methods of teaching and follow the example of Christ, it is now. Evangelism, page 53. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. Ministry of Healing, page 143. If you would approach the people acceptably, humble your hearts before God, and learn his ways, we shall gain much instruction for our work from a study of Christ's method of labor and his manner of meeting the people. Evangelism, page 53. Make Christ's work your example. Constantly, he went about doing good, feeding the hungry and healing the sick. 
no one who came to him for sympathy was disappointed. Welfare Ministry, page 53. Christ stands before us as a pattern man, the great medical missionary, an example for all who should come after. Welfare Ministry, page 53. What then is the example that we are to set to the world? We are to do the same work that the great medical missionary undertook in our behalf. We are to follow the path of self-sacrifice trodden by Christ. Welfare Ministry, page 54. Christ saw the sickness, the sorrow, the want and degradation of the multitudes that thronged his steps. Today, the same needs exist. The world is in need of workers who will labor as Christ did for the suffering and the sinful. Welfare Ministry, page 54. Do you, my brethren and sisters, inquire, what model shall we copy? I do not point you to great and good men, but to the world's Redeemer. If we would have the true missionary spirit, we must be imbued with the love of Christ. We must look to the author and finisher of our faith, study his character, cultivate his spirit of meekness and humility, and walk in his footsteps. Welfare Ministry, page 55. The Divine Commission needs no reform. Christ's way of presenting truth cannot be improved upon. The Savior gave the disciples practical lessons, teaching them how to work in such a way as to make the souls glad in the truth. He sympathized with the weary, the heavy laden, the oppressed. He fed the hungry and healed the sick. Constantly, he went about doing good. By the good he accomplished, by his loving words and kindly deeds, he interpreted the gospel to men. Welfare Ministry, page 56. The union of Christ-like work for the body and the Christ-like work for the soul is the true interpretation of the gospel. Welfare Ministry, page 33. God calls for thousands to work with him, not by preaching to those who know the truth for this time, but by warning those who have never heard the last message of mercy. Work with a heart filled with an earnest longing for souls. Do medical missionary work. Thus, you will gain access to the hearts of people and the way will be prepared for a more decided proclamation of the truth. Welfare Ministry, page 57 to 58. Medical missionary work is the pioneer work of the gospel, the door through which the truth for this time is to find entrance to many homes. God's people are to be genuine medical missionaries, for they are to learn to minister to the needs of both soul and body. The purest unselfishness is to be shown by our workers as, with the knowledge and experience gained by practical work, they go out to give treatments to the sick. As they go from house to house, they will find access to many hearts. Many will be reached who otherwise never would have heard the gospel message. Welfare Ministry, page 125. A principle is brought out in this parable of the Good Samaritan that would be well for the followers of Christ to adopt. First meet the temporal necessities of the needy and relieve their physical wants and sufferings and you will then find an open avenue to the heart where you may plant the good seeds of virtue and religion. Welfare Ministry, page 118 6. But didn't Jesus only commission us to preach the gospel? No, he commissioned us also to minister to the sick and the needy. When the Savior said, Go, teach all nations, he said also, 
These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. The promise is as far reaching as the commission. Not that all the gifts are imparted to each believer. The Spirit divides to every man severally as he will. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 11 But the gifts of the Spirit are promised to every believer according to his need for the Lord's work. The promise is just as strong and trustworthy now as in the days of the apostles. These signs shall follow them that believe. This is the privilege of God's children, and faith should lay hold on all that it is possible to have as an endorsement of faith. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. This world is a vast laser house. But Christ came to heal the sick, to proclaim deliverance to the captives of Satan. He was in himself health and strength. He imparted his life to the sick, the afflicted, those possessed of demons. He turned away none who came to receive his healing power. He knew that those who petitioned him for help had brought disease upon themselves, yet he did not refuse to heal them. And when virtue from Christ entered into these poor souls, they were convicted of sin, and many were healed of their spiritual diseases, as well as of their physical maladies. The gospel still possesses the same power, and why should we not today witness the same results? Christ feels the woes of every sufferer. When the evil spirits rend a human frame, Christ feels the curse. When fever is burning up the life current, he feels the agony. And he is just as willing to heal the sick now as when he was personally on earth. Christ's servants are his representatives, the channels for his working. He desires through them to exercise his healing power. In the Savior's manner of healing, there were lessons for his disciples. On one occasion, he anointed the eyes of a blind man with clay and bade him go wash in the pool of Siloam. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came, seeing. John 9 verse 7 The cure could be wrought only by the power of the great healer, yet Christ made use of the simple agencies of nature. While he did not give countenance to drug medication, he sanctioned the use of simple and natural remedies. To many of the afflicted ones who received healing, Christ said, Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. John 5 verse 14 Thus he taught that disease is the result of violating God's laws, both natural and spiritual. The great misery in the world would not exist did men but live in harmony with the Creator's plan. Desire of Ages, pages 823 to 824. These lessons are for us. There are conditions to be observed by all who would preserve health. All should learn what these conditions are. The Lord is not pleased with ignorance in regard to his laws, either natural or spiritual. We are to be workers together with God for the restoration of health to the body as well as to the soul. And we should teach others how to preserve and to recover health. For the sick we should use the remedies which God has provided in nature and we should point them to him who alone can restore. It is our work to present the sick and the suffering to Christ in the arms of our faith. We should teach them to believe in the great healer. We should lay hold on his promise and pray for the manifestation of his power. The very essence of the gospel is restoration, and the Savior would have us bid the sick, the hopeless, and the afflicted Take hold upon his strength. 
The power of love was in all Christ's healing, and only by partaking of that love through faith can we be instruments for his work. If we neglect to link ourselves in divine connection with Christ, the current of life-giving energy cannot flow in rich streams from us to the people. There are places where the Savior himself could not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. So now, unbelief separates the church from her divine helper. Her hold upon eternal realities is weak. By her lack of faith, God is disappointed and robbed of his glory. It is in doing Christ's work that the church has the promise of his presence. Go teach all nations, he said, and lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. To take his yoke is one of the first conditions of receiving his power. Desire of Ages, pages 824 to 825. 7. Does this work only involve the healing of disease? It also involves a work of education in obedient living. Many have expected that God would keep them from sickness merely because they have asked him to do so. But God did not regard their prayers because their faith was not made perfect by works. God will not work a miracle to keep those from sickness who have no care for themselves, but are continually violating the laws of health and make no efforts to prevent disease. When we do all that we can on our part to have health, then may we expect that the blessed results will follow, and we can ask God in faith to bless our efforts for the preservation of health. He will then answer our prayer, if his name can be glorified thereby. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 26. Let none who profess godliness regard with indifference the health of the body, and flatter themselves that intemperance is no sin, and will not affect their spirituality. A close sympathy exists between the physical and the moral nature. Councils on Diet and Food, page 43. In order to be fitted for translation, the people of God must know themselves. They must understand in regard to their own physical frames that they may be able with the psalmist to exclaim, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. They should ever have the appetite in subjection to the moral and intellectual organs. The body should be servant to the mind and not the mind to the body. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 33. Those who choose to be presumptuous, saying, The Lord has healed me, and I need not restrict my diet, I can eat and drink as I please, will ere long need in body and soul the restoring power of God. Because the Lord has graciously healed you, you must not think you can link yourselves up with the self-indulgent practices of the world. Do as Christ commanded after his work of healing. Go and sin no more. John chapter 8 verse 11 Appetite must not be your God. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 25 8. Since we are living so near to the second coming of Christ, do we have time for this work? We must do it in order to prepare for his coming. God has shown that health reform is as closely connected with the third angel's message as the hand is with the body. There is nowhere to be found so great a cause of physical and moral degeneracy as a neglect of this important subject. Those who indulge appetite and passion and close their eyes to the light for fear that they will see sinful indulgences which they are unwilling to forsake are guilty before God. Councils on Diet and Foods, pages 71 and 72. Knowledge must be gained in regards to how we eat and drink 
and the dress so as to preserve health. Sickness is caused by violating the laws of health. It is the result of violating nature's laws. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 21. God's people should place themselves where they will grow in grace, being sanctified body, soul, and spirit by the truth. When they break away from all health-destroying indulgences, they will have a clearer perception of what constitutes true godliness. A wonderful change will be seen in the religious experience. Councils on Diets and Foods, page 34. You have stumbled at the health reform. It appears to you to be a needless appendix to the truth. It is not so. It is a part of the truth. Here is a work before you which will come closer and be more trying than anything which has yet been brought to bear upon you. You are stumbling over the very blessing which heaven has placed in your path to make progress less difficult. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 39. We need to learn that indulged appetite is the greatest hindrance to mental improvement and soul sanctification. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 45. Anything that lessens physical strength enfeebles the mind and makes it less capable of discriminating between right and wrong. We become less capable of choosing the good and have less strength of will to do that which we know to be right. Councils on Diet and Foods, pages 48 to 49. As our first parents lost Eden through the indulgence of appetite, our only hope of regaining Eden is through the firm denial of appetite and passion. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 59. The controlling power of appetite will improve the ruin of thousands, when, if they had conquered on this point, they would have had moral power to gain the victory over every other temptation of Satan. But those who are slaves to appetite will fail in perfecting Christian character. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 59. God demands that the appetites be cleansed and that self-denial be practiced in regard to those things which are not good. This is a work that will have to be done before his people can stand before him a perfected people. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, pages 153 to 154. If man will cherish the light that God in mercy gives him upon health reform, he may be sanctified through the truth and fitted for immortality. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 70. 9. What relation should the principles of healthful living have in our message to the world? It should be as close as the arm to the body. The health reform, I was shown, is a part of the third angel's message and is just as closely connected with it as are the arm and hand with the human body. I saw that we as a people must make an advance move in this great work. Ministers and people must act in concert. God's people are not prepared for the loud cry of the third angel. They have a work to do for themselves which they should not leave for God to do for them. He has left this work for them to do. It is an individual work. One cannot do it for another. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 74. Health reform is to stand out more prominently in the proclamation of the third angel's message. In perfect and complete unity with the gospel ministry, the work of health reform will reveal its God-given power. Under the influence of the gospel, great reforms will be made by medical missionary work. But separate medical missionary work from the gospel and the work will be crippled. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 75. For years the Lord has been calling the attention of his people to health reform. 
This is one of the great branches of the work of preparation for the coming of the Son of Man. Councils on Diet and Foods, pages 70 to 71. I can see in the Lord's providence that the medical missionary work is to be a great entering wedge whereby the diseased soul may be reached. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 76. The great subject of reform is to be agitated and the public mind is to be stirred. Temperance in all things is to be connected with the message to turn the people of God from their idolatry, their gluttony, and their extravagance in dress and other things. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 71. He designs that the great subject of health reform shall be agitated and the public mind deeply stirred to investigate, for it is possible for men and women, with all their sinful, health-destroying, brain-enervating habits, to discern sacred truth, through which they are to be sanctified, refined, elevated, and made fit for the society of heavenly angels in the kingdom of glory. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 70. It is well in presenting the truth to unbelievers first to present some subjects upon which they will agree with us. The principles of health and temperance will appeal to their judgment, and we can from these subjects lead them on to understand the binding claims of the fourth commandment. Councils on Health, page 545. When properly conducted, the health reform is an entering wedge, making way for other truths to reach the heart. Councils on Health, page 434. 10. Is there another reason why health reform must be proclaimed at this time? Yes, it is part of a basic issue in the great controversy, obedience to God's laws. From the very beginning of the great controversy in heaven, it has been Satan's purpose to overthrow the law of God. It was to accomplish this that he entered upon his rebellion against the Creator, and though he was cast out of heaven, he has continued the same warfare upon the earth. To deceive men and thus lead them to transgress God's law is the object which he has steadfastly pursued. Great Controversy Page 582. The last great conflict between truth and error is but the final struggle of the long standing controversy concerning the law of God. Upon this battle, we are now entering. Great Controversy, page 582. Jesus, looking down to the last generation, saw the world involved in a deception similar to that which caused the destruction of Jerusalem. The great sin of the Christian world would be their rejection of the law of God, the foundation of his government in heaven and earth. Great Controversy, page 22. The transgression of physical law is the transgression of God's law. Our creator is Jesus Christ. He is the author of our being. He has created the human structure. He is the author of physical laws, as he is the author of the moral law. And the human being who is careless and reckless of the habits and practices that concern his physical life and health, sins against God. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 43. Men and women cannot violate natural law by indulging depraved appetites and lustful passions and not violate the law of God. Therefore, he has permitted the light of health reform to shine upon us, that we may see our sin in violating the laws which he has established in our being. All our enjoyment or suffering may be traced to obedience or transgression of natural law. Our gracious Heavenly Father sees the deplorable condition of men who, some knowingly but many ignorantly, are living in violation of the laws that he has established. And in love and pity to the race, 
he causes the light to shine upon health reform. He publishes his law, and the penalty that will follow the transgression of it, that all may learn and be careful to live in harmony with natural law. He proclaims his law so distinctly, and makes it so prominent that it is like a city set on a hill. All accountable beings can understand it if they will. Idiots will not be responsible. To make plain natural law and urge the obedience of it is the work that accompanies the third angel's message to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 69, and the Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 161. We cannot be too often reminded that health does not depend on chance. It is a result of obedience to law. Ministry of Healing, page 128. The progress of reform depends upon a clear recognition of fundamental truth. The foundation of all enduring reform is the law of God. We are to present in clear, distinct lines the need of obeying this law. Its principles must be kept before the people. Ministry of Healing, page 129. I was again shown that the health reform is one branch of the great work which is to fit a people for the coming of the Lord. It is as clearly connected with the third angel's message as the hand is with the body. The law of ten commandments has been lightly regarded by man, but the Lord would not come to punish the transgressors of that law without first sending them a message of warning. The third angel proclaims that message. Had men ever been obedient to the law of ten commandments, carrying out in their lives the principles of those precepts, the curse of disease now flooding the world would not be. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 69. Although the health reform is not the third angel's message, it is closely connected with it. Those who proclaim the message should teach health reform also. It is a subject that we must understand in order to be prepared for the events that are close upon us, and it should have a prominent place. Satan and his agents are seeking to hinder this work of reform, and will do all they can to perplex and burden those who heartily engage in it. Yet none should be discouraged at this, or cease their efforts because of it. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 77. We are waging a warfare upon which hang eternal results. We have unseen enemies to meet. Evil angels are striving for the dominion of every human being. Whatever injures the health not only lessens physical vigor, but tends to weaken the mental and moral powers. Indulgence in any unhealthful practice makes it more difficult for one to discriminate between right and wrong, and hence more difficult to resist evil. It increases the danger of failure and defeat. Ministry of Healing, page 128. Thus genuine medical missionary work is bound up inseparably with the keeping of God's commandments, of which the Sabbath is especially mentioned since it is the great memorial of God's creative work. Its observance is bound up with the work of restoring the moral image of God in man. This is the ministry which God's people are to carry forward at this time. This ministry, rightly performed, will bring rich blessings to the church. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 266.